Thank you very much, Professor Durst, Professor Koppelman, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yes, um, it's a great honor to be here. I'm very sorry I couldn't join yesterday evening. I was invited for a tunnel tour at the Western Wall. I can always say, do it. It's just fantastic. It's absolutely fascinating. I've been to Jerusalem for the last three days and I'm totally, I mean, it's my third time and I still see lots of new things and happenings. It's just fantastic and I'm happy to stay there for another two days to see even more of your country. Um, I am totally honored to be here as a guest speaker on such an important day. As far as I understood, this is the day one of a Hernia Society in Israel. This is a very important day. The situation of herniology worldwide has changed. And we are now from, it's just a hernia, as you said. Hernia is not really sexy, but it's so important. And you've seen the whole variety on different herniology uh, challenges. And we always see this large open abdomen. Everyone says, oh, look terrible. And these large scrotal hernias say, oh, no. Yes, but these are the minor part of the herniology world. We are talking about basic surgery. But when you start to, to get involved into herniology, you'd be surprised how often this basic surgery goes wrong. And we are living at a time where people say, oh, I do it only by laparoscopy. Oh, oh great. And I'll say, I do only by open approach. Wow. But we start to understand that herniology is not more than, just, it's more than one procedure. We have to understand if you do a laparoscopy, you have to have a plan B. You have to have a plan B if you have to convert. In Germany, we see surgeons that have been taught only one technique. They can do only laparoscopic with a tap or tap, and that's it. So as soon as they run into problems, they run into real problems, because they cannot even do a Liechtenstein or a, a suture repair anymore. Suture repair is down to, let's say, 15% in Germany. 15 to 20% is only by, by suture repair, and only usually the outpatient uh, doctors do that. In hospitals, hardly nobody does a suture repair anymore. So when you, when you in, involved into herniology, you're surprised to see how often things go wrong. And it's, I think it's, it's so important to stress that this building up a society that focus on herniology is so, so important. And I congratulate for this initiative and I wish you all the best for your future because it is such an important matter, uh, focus. In Germany, I was with Schumpelig, um, in the, in, the, in the initial group when we built up the German Hearn Society. The German Hearn Society is 12 years old now. We started out as a group of 30 surgeons, mainly meeting for once a year, drinking and whining, having a good time, sharing focus, interests. Now we have approximately 500 members we are a huge, very active society. We are the biggest <coughs> chapter of the European Hernia Society. And, and I think this is something you might consider also to combine a membership in your new society with the membership in the European Hernia Society. Make it obligatory to be both, to keep in contact with the European Hernia Society because that is even more interesting. As a member, you get the, 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 the official uh, access to the Hernia Journal and things like that. Think about it, because it is, once you get involved into the Hernia family, and there is a worldwide Hernia family, you'll be impressed how often they meet, how friendly they are with each other, how open they are. And it's, it's just a fantastic uh, chance to share common interests. Now, today I have the pleasure to talk about just a moment. Uh, this is. Take this out. I must ask to no. touch you because I have okay. a microphone. Oh, sorry. My microphone. Okay, sorry. Um, let me just say, yes. can we take this one down? Yeah, yeah. down, down. down. Go Where here. is yours? This is this one. Let me take it. this one. Let me go okay. here. Okay, I do Okay, thank you. So, when we, when we talk about hernia, 
we could stay here for the next two weeks discuss the everyday a new topic. So today I I'm, I'm have the pleasure to talk about devices, about meshes, something that has, has been concluded with, included to herniology for the last decade. And nowadays we all agree that in many cases a hernia should be done with a mesh repair. Not in all cases, but in most cases. But I will not talk about technique today, though it's important because uh, my last slide is going to tell you that it's even with a good mesh, with a bad technique, you won't have success. So it all goes together. But the mesh decision is an important decision. Uh, is there a play forward? No. How do I get it done? Oh, just probably this one. Okay. So I was invited by, by Ethicon a long time ago to be part of the advisory board and we met and it's, what I tell you now with the next 45 minutes is something we put together as a group with uh, Frederick Berwitt from Belgium, uh, Michael Schadi from the uh, UK and Pierre Costa from, uh, I think he's from Italy. And under the auspices of Ethicon, we developed some kind of a, a scientific background on the search of the right mesh. And they call it the Pure Progress, and you probably some of you have learned about it. Uh, that's, that's a new initiative of Ethicon. Now, when we talk about hernia, we talk about something very common. And if I count around your uh, this audience are one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Every fifth man has a good chance to show up with a hernia, which is good for us because we are interested in hernia, so we will never be out of a job. Incisional hernia, strange enough, 18%. 2013, we're still talking about 18%. Now, just imagine you produce a car, and every 18th car, 18% 18 of your cars have a, have a failure impossible. It's fascinating how we as surgeons can live with such a defeat. 18% come back for incisional hernia repair. So we are talking about really big numbers. Now you all know the historical perspective, the Middle Ages, and then the, the famous names like Bassini, Bilrot, Scholdeis, the uh, famous mesh by Usher, Francis Usher, the techniques like stopper reefs, Liechtenstein, the tap, and the lap eye pump techniques. So there are lots of different techniques in the evolution of herniology. Now we know nowadays that using a mesh in ingual hernia repair does have a great impact, even regardless of method of placement. If you do it a plug, a patch, a Liechtenstein, a tap, a TEP, whatever, we can certainly improve our results. There have been some guidelines and the European Health Society was set together lots of times looking at the literature. But this is the so-called evidence, evidence by literature. It's not eminence, it is evidence. So it says, tells you what we find in the literature. But these are all on randomized controlled trials. The problem of this is there are very few randomized controlled trials nowadays on down repair, on shoulders repair. So that's why these these um, uh, procedures are not really well uh, documented in this evidence, in this uh, uh, guidelines. Anyway, what we can see here nowadays is mesh recommendation for Liechtenstein or endoscopic uh, for the primary unilateral and primary bilateral. And for recurrent hernia, there's no question about it, you should use a mesh also. And for ventral hernia, it's even more obvious that the only repair that has some success is a mesh repair. And we know from, from wonderful studies from the Netherlands, if you do a suture repair, after five years, you have a recurrence rate of about 65% after a suture repair of incisional hernia. And that is terrible. That is something we should not live with. When we look at the uh, uh, European, Middle East and Asia, Africa, uh, Middle, Asia Middle East and Africa market, we are approximately having about two million procedures each year. So much for big numbers. That's unbelievable how many surgeries are performed for hernias. The problem is we have to decide. We as surgeons, we have to decide what kind of mesh 
should be placed. That's extremely difficult because there are just too many devices on the market. So how should a surgeon decide on what kind of mesh to take? We learned about this lightweight mesh. Came to, uh, it came to Earth in uh, 1970, 1970, yes, with the first Vipro mesh. And ever since we are talking about weight. So, first question is, what is a lightweight mesh in your approach? What would you say? Is it more than 140 grams per square meters or less? Where do you say the limit is for a lightweight mesh? And how large should the pore size be for a lightweight mesh? Well, at the end of my talk, I'm hopefully that you will be able to answer these questions very soon. But until then, we are still on the search for the ideal mesh. It's like the knights, they are looking for the holy, uh, um, um, what's it called? The holy, right, yeah. What we need to avoid is that you don't want that. And anybody of you had the doubtful pleasure to explant a mesh, that's not funny, that's terrible. We harm our patients with these meshes. So you've got to be very, very careful. That's something we do not want. So when we th think about the surgery, and when you go back to the OR tomorrow morning, who is going to be in charge of the mesh decision? Is it the surgeon? Is it the industry? Or is it the administration saying, listen, I know you want this mesh, but it's too expensive. You have to take the other mesh. The question remains, who is in charge? Who is in charge for this decision? Who is in charge for the meshes on stock? Because we all know one mesh is not enough. You need some meshes for intraabdominal placement, you need meshes for external placement, and uh, maybe for laparoscopic placement. So who is in charge of that? And last but not least, who is in charge of the mesh complications? The mesh decision is unique, a surgical decision. It's our decision, and we need to take this responsibility. It's all about responsibility, my talk because I, I want you to understand how important that is, that you as surgeons have a great impact <coughs> on the future life of our patients. So that is very, very important. So when we look at our daily presence in the, in the hospital, when you run a surgery without any complications, what does the patient say? Yeah, I have excellent wound healing. It's the patient who did the job. Uh, everything is fine. Now, if the same surgery runs with complications, where does the finger point to? It right to you. Now, the surgeon must have done something wrong. So, the patient, where does he go to? Does he go to the administration who told you to take a cheaper mesh? Does he go to the sales rep and say, listen, I looked at your brochure, nice pictures, but now I have adhesions with the mesh. Why? Do I have these complications? No. The, surgeon's, the, the patient, the unhappy patient, comes to you and says, listen, I have to complain. Something went wrong. Something with the mesh, something with the technique. But you as a surgeon, you are responsible. So we do see complications after surgery. We see complications after surgery with mesh. Recurrences, discomfort, chronic pain, infection with various numbers. And all these things do have an impact. Not only, but some impact is done by the mesh decision. So who is to blame? Is it the patient, the surgeon, the administration, the sales rep? In 1994, we were invited to join the Suveta meetings. And Schumpelig, who was chairing this meeting, he said to his co-worker Klinge, Klinge, be so nice to prepare a talk on meshes, experimental results in a review of literature. So Klinge started this whole development of new mesh research and he found out there is no literature. In 1994 there was hardly any literature on meshes, on experiments on meshes. There were only two or three meshes on the market, Proline, Marlex, Merzinina. That were the three major players at that time. And uh, it was strange to see that they have no real background to it. 
But the cosmos of hernia repair is a huge, it's a multifactorial challenge. We have patient-related factors, we have surgeon-related factors, we have surgical technical related factors and we have the mass selection and that's the one we're talking about today. So when you use a mesh you have, when you place a mesh you have always some tissue reaction. This interaction has been looked at by Professor Klosterhoff, the pathologist of the Aachen group and he looked at the host reaction to mesh implants. And you can see here during the operation, when you place the mesh, immediately you have protein attachment, cytokines come, growth factors come, and at the, after the, the couple of days you see macrophages come, lymphocytes come, they try to get rid of this foreign material, finding out it's non-absorbable. And what do they do? Whenever we have a foreign body in our, our uh, organism, we encapsulate it. And so the fibroblasts come and you have a scar formation around your mesh. And whatever mesh you use, every mesh induces a chronic foreign body reaction. Every mesh does that. There's no question about it. It's just the degree of foreign body reaction that you cause, or that, you, that we can influence. How does it look like? Just imagine you have a filament. This is a multi-filament of a mesh. And if you see the inside, these are, this is the, the, the filament itself, multi-filament, the mesh fibers. Around it, you see the so-called inner granuloma. It's caused by inflammation and mainly by macrophages. This is the acute reaction by macrophages. And after some days, when the macrophages fail in their job, the fibroblasts come and they encapsulate the mesh fibers. So you get the so-called outer granuloma. You see the fibrotic reaction by fibrocytes. And this is what you see in every foreign body material, in any mesh fibers that you have, you will see this just with different degrees. Some with a smaller granuloma, some with a larger granuloma. And that's important. And this way we can differentiate between these different materials. What does this granuloma formation lead to? Well, it certainly alters the mass tissue dynamics and its outcomes of our hernia repair. So we all heard about mesh shrinkage. You heard about that? Let's see. It's not a rich, it's not a, a polymer shrinkage. The polymer does not shrink. It's the scar tissue around the polymer that leads to mesh shrinkage. It's a change of surface area that we have, leading to reduced uh, surface area. This leads to a stiffness of our material, as I showed you on the video. It might even lead to more seroma formation. It has a chance of nerve entrapment and certainly gives place for infection. And you see this passive compression of tissue, huh? how this large piece narrows in surface area. So this passive compression, this shrinkage, is a surface reduction caused by the retraction of the fibrotic scar tissue around the mesh. Passively, it can compress up to 50% which can result in a recurrence of, as the mesh will not cover the former defect anymore. And we have stiffness. This is the mesh plug, plug and patch, very famous in the US and uh, in China. This is a for, uh, Amy called them meshoma. Uh, and this, in this ingle area, you don't want that. So stiffness has a great impact on the outcome. And the scar plates result in the mesh become stiff and non-flexible. And this might cause the sense of rigidity and discomfort. Nerve entrapment. 10 out of 10 explants you will find in the S100 staining, you will find nerve within the scar. 10 out of 10. It's not surprising. If you have a, a strong scar formation, the scars will be included. Infection. Infection is something we hear about, but to be honest, it's it usually it's not not the, the, the mesh itself that leads to infection. It's just that the mesh the mesh is giving you some it provides some surface area for bacterial colonization. So it's not the mesh that causes infection, but it's a surface area that leads to a bacterial colonization, and that might to delete delayed healing and might be a recurrence risk factor. So conclusion of this foreign body granuloma, 
Every foreign body granuloma produces, induces a chronic inflammatory reaction, fibrosis, that might lead to compression, shrinkage, stiffness. And I saw patients with stiffness, with the Malix mesh from here to here. And I asked them, please close your shoes. They could not, because it was a scar plate. They could not bend forward far enough to close their shoes. So they had to pick up their shoes and do it this way somehow, or the wife was doing it. Uh, and that's important. We have to consider that we place large pieces of mesh into this uh, abdominal wall and we have to make it better. So this was a start in 1994 when Klinger looked at the, the meshes available and that was the start of research in Aachen on large pore lightweight meshes. The idea was to optimize the integration, less foreign body reaction and how can you do that? minimize induced clinical complications by less foreign material. So how would the optimal mesh look like? So what are the characteristics of the optimal mesh? And therefore we're going now into terminology because these are the words that you need to handle. These are the words you need to use when you meet a sales rep. Ask about tensile strength, mesh elasticity, porosity, surface area and the weight. So, when we look at all these factors, the polymers, the filament, the weave pattern, and the pore size, these are the four main pillars for your technical reactions, like parameters like tensile strength, elasticity, porosity, surface area, and weight. And when we can change to the less foreign body reaction, we will see less complications. We will see less shrinkage, more, less stiffness, less aroma, less, less nerve direction, uh, reaction and less infection. So we will see less complaints. We will see more satisfied patients and we will see more satisfied surgeons. So, when we look at these factors, what we want. We want sufficient strength, we want mesh elasticity resembling the abdominal wall. We need a large pore size, this way we can reduce the, uh, the foreign material. We need a low surface so we have less contact area for bacterial colonization and the weight. Well, we get to the weight later on. So, how much strength does the mesh need? It's very simple. The strengths that the mesh needs should be resembling the strengths of the fascia. And this is very simple. And you want this to be for the rest of the patient's life. So Klinger did some wonderful calculations. Nobody understood. You can also use the Laplace law. And when you use the Laplace law, you end up with uh, the uh, millimeter mercury of 250. That is what you have as a pressure in the interdomal position that you want to withstand. And when you see standing, pain, vomiting, this is very low. And the coughing, the coughing is below 200. So when you are above 250, you should have sufficient strength to, uh, to meet the requirements of the abdominal wall. And when you look at different measures, they all are far beyond these 250s. They are more made for the repair of an elephant hernia but certainly not for a human being. We are just going over the top. So there are some materials that we learned that are not as good as other polymers. So we know from publications from the 80s and 90s that polyester, for example, has not such a good durability. On the other hand, let's be honest, Durella, the, the polyester has been on the market for the last 60, 50 years. So nowadays we have polyester monofilament and I think they do quite as good as well. Nevertheless, so the requirements that we should talk about is maximum strength, about 250 millimeters mercury, and the dura durability that like, leads to a, a, a lifelong withstand. So, mesh elasticity. I showed you these videos, and you see these meshes, ex vivo, how that is. You can see how elastic, how the elasticity is, and they show different elasticity in different directions. This is a 
a large pore mesh two years after implantation. And you can see the elasticity, the compliance of this mesh. Two years after implantation, no knocking at the door. This is soft, this is, shows a good elasticity. And this is another laparoscopic mesh explanted. Looks awful. You don't want this in your patient's body. So when we consider how much elasticity do we need, we look at uh, the anatomy. And we went to the anatomy, we took some fresh corpse, and we worked on the elasticity of the abdominal wall, and what we found was it's in vertical direction, you need 25%. In horizontal direction, you need 15%. This was also shown by measurements by laparoscopy. If you do a laparoscopy with 50 millimeters mercury, you can see how the, um, the different directions show different dist uh, distensions, elasticity. So that's what we want. And if you look at the elasticity of implanted meshes, in the 90s we looked at this uh, 3D geography. So we measured, the, by indirect measurement, the uh, elasticity of the abdominal wall, the radius and the height differences after mesh implantation. And what we found is that mesh 1, which was a small pore malix mesh, medium mesh, mesh 2, and the large pore meshes, using a large pore mesh, we were close to the same as a control group. So resembling the anatomy of the abdominal wall even after surgery. So large pore meshes are advantages for the abdominal wall function. So the conclusion of mesh elasticity is 25% in vertical direction, 50% in horizontal direction, approximately 2 to 1 stretch. So the use of highly elastic meshes is certainly favorable. Elasticity required in all directions. We're learning a new term today. Porosity. Porosity is something which is, I think, the word of the future when we talk about meshes. Porosity is quite simple when you look at that. The first one is a, a Malix mesh. You see the mesh pores are about 600 micrometers from each other. So if you see your foreign body granuloma, they're strong enough and they meet so they call a mesh bridging, a scar bridging. And so you re, you, what you get is a scar plate. The whole mesh is encapsulated. If you look at the lower one, you see the, the, the pore size is so large that the two perifilamental granuloma, they don't meet. There's no chance for scar bridging. So what you get is a scar net. And that is much better for the compliance. And when we look at porosity, this is the porosity you can you have when you take the mesh out of the package. And the initial porosity relates to the percentage of the area of the mesh which is not covered by tissue. But when we look at that, we have to, this is what we call the initial porosity. But when we go further, we have to think about the effective porosity, the porosity that includes the foreign body granuloma. So after ingrowth, the uh, effective porosity is much smaller. So what you have is this lamp. Klinger looked at 1,000 explanted meshes, and they built up a classification, a new classification for meshes according to the pore size. And you can see class 1, large pore meshes, textile porosity of more than 60% or an effective porosity of more than zero. And this can be achieved by monofilament, multifilament, mixed structures, but the question is not weight, the question is not coating, the question is porosity, yeah? the, the large pore size. And we see class two, the small pore sizes, the mesh with special features, meshes with films, 3D meshes, and class six, the biologicals. So, Looking at the surface area, and this is a new term also, the surface area has a big impact. I, showed, I told you about the, the, the surface area that is able, or which, is, which leads to colonization of bacteria. So 
the less surface area you have, the better it is. And this was shown by the study that uh, looked at the monofilament and multifilament. And you can see whatever concentration you have of stuff out, the smaller your surface area, <coughs> and in monofilament you have less contact area, the better it is for uh, the less colonization you see. This is quite simple. The surface area factors is the length of total mesh polymer, the polymer radius, and the polymer composition. Means if you have a multifilament polymer, you have more surface area. Simple calculations. When you look at this, mesh one, mesh two, and one is a heavyweight with 100 grams per square meter, and one is 33 square meters. And you want to prepare these meshes, you need 150 meters to prepare mesh one, and 50 meters to prepare mesh two. At the end, you have a difference of one gram. 1.5 gram mesh weight versus 1.5 uh, gram. So that's the difference of one gram. You think one gram does make a difference? No, certainly not. But what makes a difference is the surface area that you can calculate. You can see mesh one has a surface area three times as high as the large pore mesh as mesh two. So that's important. And we know that the construction of multifilament is increased of a surface area by 135%. So the conclusion is our mesh should be a monofilament with thin filament, a monofilament structure with the thin filaments that reduces the contact area but is strong enough. So when we talk about now on weight, what is a lightweight mesh? And that's where lots of confusion came up in the surgical society. And lots of products came on the market saying, we have a lightweight mesh. But via a critical opposer of the Aachen group, he made a, a calculation on the weight. And you can see here that the weight differences between different meshes, same size but different compositions, was somewhere around 2 to less than 2 grams per uh, per, uh, per mesh. So that means that's very strange. And he looked at heavyweight meshes with 90 grams per square meters and the lightweight mesh with 35 grams. But when you look at the lightweight mesh, you hardly see any pores. So this is more a film, but very light. Unfortunately, he could prove that the lightweight mesh showed a worse biocompatibility. Bio it showed much more foreign body reaction, more scar around it, than the heavyweight mesh. So the weight certainly is not in, in, uh, in, uh, in the right term for differentiation. And this is uh, 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 a publication by Koda. Koda did it two years ago, and he looked at 150 different polypropylene devices. And he put up some different classes by weight, not by structure, not by pore size, only by weight. And it's 10 pages in the Hernia Journal. It's a waste of time reading it because it has no impact. It has no impact at all. The problem of terminology today is that lightweight mesh is not the same as a large pore mesh. We see meshes now that are lightweight but have small pores. And we see heavyweight meshes, like the Dynamesh. The Dynamesh by Dahlhausen is, is a mesh from PVDF, it's a very heavy mesh. But you can construct the mesh with large pores. Still it's a heavy mesh, but it has large pores. So we should forget about this kind of terminology. We should not talk about lightweight meshes anymore. Forget about lightweight meshes. We need to talk about high porosity, low surface area meshes. A ter terrible term, maybe you have a better term for it. We can do some brainstorming afterwards, but this is what we're looking at. We need flat meshes with a high porosity in an effective porosity of more than 30, uh, 60, uh, 60 and with a low surface area that we can reach by using monofilament and thin filaments. 
So when we look now at the mesh design that we want and its outcomes, the tensile strengths should be somewhere around 250 uh, newton or uh, millimeters, not newton, millimeters per square, millimeters mercury. The mesh elasticity should be 20 to 30 percent in all directions. High porosity at least 60 percent. Low surface monofilament uh, area, monofilament uh, uh, filament structure. And the weight, forget about the weight. We're not talking about weight anymore when we uh, try to differentiate meshes. So what we are heading for is tensile strength, elasticity, porosity, low surface, forget about the weight. And by doing that, using these terms for your mesh decision, you can reduce the foreign body reaction. You can reduce shrinkage, stiffness, probably less seroma, less foreign body reaction means less nerve reaction, entrapment and you see less infection because we see have less area for bacterial colonization. We will see less this discomfort, less pain, less recurrences. We will see more satisfied patients and therefore we as surgeons will be more happy because we all know these patients that come back after ingle hernia repair with pain. And we stand in front of it and say, what should we do? And it's even worse after laparoscopic surgery, because in open surgery you can always try to remove the mesh, you can cut the nerves. But in laparoscopic ingle hernia repair, that's difficult. And we see these patients, young, <coughs> sportive patients. It's a, it's a, it's a ben benign surgery, it's something... And we see these people after an elective surgery, pain, pain, pain normal job, suffering for the rest of their life. And we see these patients and they go from one surgeon to the next, traveling around Europe, Germany, wherever, and they suffer. And by choosing the right mesh, it will not make every pain go away, but it's one, one important step, one important step into the right direction. Is there evidence to that? Literature to that? Well, the problem now that we see is that the literature we have, it shows that there is significant improvement of lightweight meshes. But in this group of lightweight meshes, there are even the small pore meshes in there, the lightweight small pore meshes. So actually, we need to start all over again our evidence with these large pore, low surface uh, area meshes. But what we see so far from the meta-analysis we have, we have advantages in terms of chronic post-operative pain and feeling of foreign body. But just keep in mind, the patient outcome, it's not only based on your mesh decision. You need to be a passion surgeon who takes it serious. And I think, as Professor Koppelman said, education is extremely important. And this is going to be one of the major pillars of a hernia society, to look at the standardization of hernia surgery. That you as a society will give input into the big family of surgery to say this is the way a Liechtenstein should be performed. Not your personal modifications, but a standard procedure. Same as laparoscopy and a shoulder. You know, a shoulder is repair is a clear standardized procedure. We did a, a survey in Germany asking 200 surgeons in a hernia meeting, tell me how you perform a shoulder repair. Poor shoulders. 30% did original shoulders. 30. Four rows. 30% only. So wherever shoulders is written on it doesn't mean shoulders is in it. That's the same for Liechtenstein and the same for tap repair. Everybody tells you I use large meshes. Everybody says 10 to 15 centimeters at least. Well, that's the size the mesh has when you take it out of the package. But they all take the scissor and start to cut a little bit here, cut a little bit there. They place inside, it's still too big, take it out again, cut a little bit more. 
but documentation is 10 to 15. I would love to see the real mesh sizes. And we're working on that. We're working on mesh size by making meshes visible by MRT <coughs> scan. There are now meshes for scientific purpose where you have some nanoparticles integrated in the polymer. So you can do an MRT scan after surgery and you can see we construct the mesh. You see how these meshes look like in vivo and you see how much folding there is. And we all know this laparoscopic TAP or tip uh, repair. When you do an ultrasound after a couple of weeks, you can see this folding, sorry, this folding of these meshes. So, you have to be passionate as a surgeon to do a good surgery. You have to have a good technique, a standardized technique, and you have to take great care on your messages. And I hope with my little talk, I gave you the chance or give you the terminology. The next time the sales rep shows up and provides some beautiful shining brochures saying no adhesions, no problems, no complications, that you will ask him, okay, tell me about it. Tell me about elasticity in vivo. Tell me about mesh size. Tell me about pore size, uh, about filaments. Uh, now that you ask, now that you've knowledge, you can ask the right questions and this will improve your mess decision. It's not the nurse, it's not the administration, it's we, we as surgeons that have to take the responsibility for this mess decision. And there's evidence out there that these large pore meshes, low surface meshes are of great <coughs> impact on our outcome. So. The mesh alone will not do the job, but it will help us to do a better job. Thank you very much. So I'm happy to take some questions.